So here we're going to do elbow anatomy and biomechanics, and we'll start this with a question. So on the figure, which we'll show you in a second, what is the structure indicated by the letter A in figure 21? Here's the figure, and this is the structure that we're talking about. This is the lateral side of the elbow with the radial head, and we all know that this would be, uh, as we go to answer this, that this would be the radial collateral ligament. These are some of the answers that have been done in the past. But if we back up this slide one time and go back to the anatomy picture, the radial collateral is here, the radial ulnar humeral ligament here, and the annular ligament here. And that's the three constructs of the radial side of the elbow for stability purposes. And we'll cover that again. The elbow joint uh, anatomy and biomechanics includes the ulnohumeral articulation, the radial capitellar joint, and the proximal radial ulnar joint. Elbow function is crucial for activities of daily living, requiring a certain arc of motion. It acts to position the hand in space to be used. Without that elbow joint, you can't reach your mouth, you can't do personal hygiene. The functional arc of motion was delineated by Bernie Moray many years ago in the lab at Mayo was as 30 to 130 of flexion extension. There's been recent uh, papers come in that say maybe minus 20 is more applicable to activities of daily living now with the computer world that we live in. At least 50 degrees of pronation and supination are necessary, uh, again, for activities of daily living. The normal carrying angle moves from 5 to 10 to males, a little bit accentuated in females, and diminishes somewhat with flexion becoming more straight. Axial load in the extended elbow shows that 40% of the weight is through the ulnohumeral joint, and interestingly enough, 60% through the radial ulnohumeral articulation. As far as osteology is concerned, the humerus has the spiral groove where the radial nerve will cover that a little bit more later. It's about 13 centimeters proximal to the articular surface of the trochlea. <clears throat> the distal flare of the humerus provides medial and lateral epicondyles, which are attachments for the forearm muscle. The trochlea is spool-shaped and is located medially and articulates with this part of the uh, ulna, as you see in here. The capitellum is located laterally, is very rounded, and then you see the sublime tubercle uh, on the ulna here, and we'll talk about that some more, and then you can see how the radius rotates back and forth with the bicipital groove down here uh, for insertion of the biceps tendon. The alignment provide, of the distal humerus provides an anterior tilt. It's not a straight bone. It comes down, and then the, the joint surface actually then turns and faces anteriorly, as you see here. Usually about 6 degrees of valgus. You can internally rotate by about 5 degrees. The axis of rotation, uh, in this case, is centered on the trochlea and the capitellum and, and passes through the anterior-inferior medial epicondyle. It's a pivot joint as the radial ulnar humeral joint below. Um, the radial head is covered by articular cartilage for approximately 240 degrees. This only gives you the lateral 120 degrees of the radius, as you see here, for fixation purposes. Anything else that penetrates anywhere will limit your pronation and supination. So this is a critical concept when thinking about internal rotation or internal fixation of radial head fractures. Bono humeral articulation is a hinge joint. Very important that you be able to flex and extend and have those rotations where the coronoid tip, uh, right, uh, right here, the coronoid tip uh, really provides stability. It's a buttress effect and is an essential part of stability of the elbow and providing bony stability. Let's move forward here. Here we go. As far as the capsule is concerned, it's maximally distended at about 70 to 80 degrees of flexion. That's why the elbow wants to stay in that position after injury because that provides the most space. The distal attachment is found about 6 millimeters distal to the tip of the coronoid, and it's very important to remember that the radial nerve lies right adjacent to this distal anterolateral capsule uh, when you're thinking about uh, capsule release. The muscles of the elbow include the flexors, which are the biceps and brachialis. The biceps attaches at the distal level at the radial tuberosity, whereas the brachialis attaches on the more distal part of the coronoid. Extensions are the triceps tendon. So question here, in figure two, which of the following structures is the primary stabilizer in preventing valgus instability of the elbow? primary stabilizer in preventing valgus instability of the elbow, and that, of course, would be the anterior band of the medial ulnar collateral ligament, or medial collateral ligament. 
This is critical because this is your Tommy John ligament. This is the ligament that Dr. Joe first reconstructed in Tommy John. Very common injury in baseball. Some would say it's at epidemic proportions now. And this would have been covered by Chris Ahmad very well last week, I think. As far as static stabilizers, you have the coronoid in the front. And we know that loss of 50% or more of coronoid uh, height can result in increased elbow instability. So repairing those fractures that are more than that are, are quite essential. The medial ulnar collateral ligament is composed of the anterior, posterior, and transverse bundles. As you see on this one, the anterior band going from the anterior humeral epicondyle down to the sublime tubercle of the ulna provides resistance to valgus and to distractive stresses. However, the uh, posterior band, or, uh, as you see here, is one of the areas that will contract and limit elbow flexion in traumatic cases. It's, and it needs, sometimes it needs to be released, and it's overlied by the ulnar nerve. So the primary static stabilizers, again, are the anterior bundle of the medial ulnar collateral ligament for valgus stress. The posterior bundle is the primary restraint to valgus stress in maximum elbow flexion. And when contracted, flexion may be limited. And then the transverse bundle, we have yet to find out what it does. It's certainly going to do something along the way. Uh, the anterior bundle of the UCL, again, is the most important restraint against valgus stress. This is a commonly asked question. The posterior bundle is the primary restraint in maximum flexion, and when contracted, flexion may be limited. And here you see a paper by Dr. O'Driscoll on where the medial ulnar collateral ligament originates from the anterior part of the medial epicondyle. He actually wrote this paper because neurosurgeons were, uh, were routinely decompressing the ulnar nerve by doing a medial epicondylectomy, and when they took too much of that medial epicondyle, then the elbow would become unstable because they accidentally detached the origin of that ligament, leading to valgus instability, which can be a problem um, in, in, in cases in which this happens. So question number 19, the sublime tubercle of the elbow serves as the insertion site of the, and we just went over this like three times, the anterior bundle of the medial collateral ligament. Very important. That's exactly where it hits on that sublime tubercle. So again, going on with the lateral side of the elbow, which is a bit more complex than the medial side, you have three ligaments that are all kind of wrapped up in one, supported as well by the ankyneus muscle. So the lateral collateral ligament arises from the isometric point on the lateral aspect of the capitellum, sort of distal on the lateral epicondyle. Optimal stability is conferred with a, with a properly tensioned repair. So here you see that radial collateral ligament in the front. It's uh, often commonly associated with the deep part of the extensor carpi radialis brevis, but provides direct in, uh, stabilization to varus forces. The lateral ulnar collateral ligament comes off the uh, arcade down here and moves back up. As we said, it's the primary restraint to valgus and external rotation strength. This is the ligament that's primarily involved with posterolateral rotatory instability, and it inserts as a unit on the crista supinatoris of the proximal ulna. The accessory collateral ligament or lateral collateral ligament complex, some people believe that these things contribute substantially to lateral elbow stability. Uh, anatomy studies and biomechanical studies have been variable in the contributions of these ligaments. And then lastly, the annular ligament provides stability to the proximal radial ulnar joint and is intimately associated with the other two ligaments, providing a really a trifurcate ligament that stabilizes this lateral side to rotatory forces. <clears throat> Secondary stabilizes the radial capitella joint, which functions as an important constraint to valgus stress, the capsule, which contributes to stability occasionally with the elbow fully extended, and of course the dynamic stabilizers and the origins of the flexor and extensor tendons. <clears throat> dynamic stabilizers include the ankyneus, as shown here with this small pointer that runs across the joint, often used to supplement stability. The brachialis, triceps, and biceps provide compressive stability to the joint and a dynamic force. How about the nerves of the elbow? Well, we start with the musculocutaneous, musculocutaneous nerve. Its origin is from the lateral cord of the brachial plexus. It exits laterally distal to the biceps tendon, will terminate with one branch as the lateral anabrachiocutaneous nerve, often damaged by retraction when distal biceps repairs. It usually seats, sits deep to the cephalic vein. This musculocutaneous nerve supplies the biceps and brachialis, and the nerve runs between these muscles. The radial nerve originates off the posterior cord of the brachial plexus along with the axillary nerve. 
the anatomy at the elbow, it leaves a triangular interval in the teres major, long head of triceps. It crosses the, the groove, spiral groove of the humerus, and then moves anteriorly and distally. It's very important to remember that this will sit right in front of your anterior inferior lateral elbow capsule. So if you're doing a capsulectomy for a stiff elbow, and Matt's going to talk about that later, that nerve is at high risk in that area. The median nerve originates from the medial and lateral cords of the brachial plexus. It goes with the brachial artery. It's very much anterior. It's always superficial to the brachialis muscle at the level of the elbow joint. So if you're doing any surgery within the elbow, the brachialis is your friend. It protects the elbow or protects this nerve from any intraarticular procedures. The ulnar nerve originates from the medial cord of the brachial plexus. It runs medial to the brachial artery, pierces the intermuscular septum at the level of the arcade of struthers, and enters the posterior compartment, runs posterior to the medial epicondyle, sitting right on that posterior bundle of the medial ulnar collateral ligament, and then branches out as it moves down the forearm with no branches in the upper arm. First motor branch of the FCU is just distal to the elbow joint. The brachial artery provides the blood flow to the elbow for the most part with the superior and inferior ulnar collateral ligaments and then nutrient vessels as well as muscular and supertrochlear vessels. As far as anatomy and biomechanics is concerned, the motion vectors are primarily flexion and extension. There are large joint reaction forces across the elbow, especially with sports due to the short and relatively inefficient lever arms around the elbow. Biceps is very close to the center of rotation, and the center of rotation is in a line through the isometric points between the capitellum and about the trochlea. This isometric line is important when placing a hinged external fixator because that's where the, the fulcrum of movement will come, otherwise the elbow will tend to still be unstable in flexion or extension. In this free body diagram, you can see that the static loads often across the elbow are close to body weight uh, when dynamic loads are actually greater than body weight. Think of throwing a ball where those forces exceed the whole weight of the body. If you enjoyed this video, please consider leaving a like. We'd love to hear your thoughts and what you'd like to see next in the comments. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and follow us on social media.